DNA. Yeah, so now let's uh, look at the section. And again, for further information, you go to the separate DNA uh, article on Wikipedia. So D deoxyribonucleic acid or nucleic acid DNA is a molecule composed of two polynucleotide chains that coil around each other to form a double helix carrying genetic uh, hereditary information. The two DNA strands are known as polynucleotides as they are composed of monomers called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is composed of one of four nitrogenous bases, cytosine C, guanine G, adenine A, and, and thiamine uh, T. That's a thiamine T, uh, and a sugar called deoxyribose, and a phosphate group. Uh, the nucleotides are joined to one another in a chain by covalent bonds between the sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate of the next. And uh, yeah, resulting in an alter, uh, alternating sugar phosphate backbone. And yes, note the backbone chain of a polymer is the longest series of covalently bonded atoms that together create the continuous chain of the molecule. Uh, so it is the sequence of these four bases along the backbone that encodes genetic information. Bases of the two polynucleotide strands are bound together by hydrogen bonds according to base pairing, uh, base pairing rules. A with T and C with G, yeah, to make the double-stranded DNA. So notice that yes, you have covalent bonds uh, for the backbone where you're sharing the electrons, and then you have hydrogen bonds, which is just electrostatic attraction of the electronegativity, different electronegativities with the. Uh, so you have hydrogen connecting to the negative side of the other base pair, and so on. And then this makes double-stranded DNA. Going further, so the bases are divided into two groups: uh, pyrimidines. Yeah, pyrimidines and purines. In DNA, the pyrimidines are thiamine and cytosine, whereas the purines are adenine and guanine. The two strands of DNA run in opposite directions to each other and are thus anti-parallel. DNA is replicated once the two strands separate. And again, I've gone over these in the previous sections, and this is just following with the the biology uh, Wikipedia article, and it gets to DNA here. But uh, yeah, we now have a big background to understand all this. So DNA is replicated once the two strands separate. Going further here is an uh, illustration. So bases lie between two spiraling atom strands. So there's the bases are connected here, hydrogen bonds in the, in the middle of these the spiraling strands. And then the backbone is uh, sugar and phosphate uh, covalent bonds alternating. A gene is a, uni a unit of heredity that corresponds to a region of DNA that influences the form or function of an organism in specific ways. DNA is found as linear chromosomes in eukaryotes and circular chromosomes in prokaryotes. So the other linear uh, or the chromosomal setup. And and then the other one is circular chromosomes in prokaryotes the, uh, without the nucleus. The, a chromosome is an organized structure consisting of DNA and histones. Remember, uh, I went over histones, which are just these spools for the DNA. So just proteins that, that the DNA spools around. The set of chromosomes in a cell and any other hereditary information found in the mitochondria, chloroplasts, or other locations is collectively known as a cell's genome. Yeah, so nucleus, so mitochondria, chloroplast, etc., or anywhere else known as the, uh, altogether is known as cell's genome. In eukaryotes, uh, genomic DNA is uh, localized in the cell nucleus or with small amounts in mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, in prokaryotes, uh, the DNA is held within an ir irregularly shaped body in the cytoplasm called the nucleoid. And here's MES note right here. Yeah, so let's just uh, MES note and look at this uh, typical prokaryotic cell. And yes, yeah, so there's a nucleotide, just a regular shaped body there. This contains all the DNA in there. And there's some ribosomes across there. The cytoplasm is the inside of the uh, cell. And then there's the plasma membrane and has a cell wall and there's a capsule. It's pretty much like a, yeah, like a drug capsule. Very interesting. And then there's a, a flagellum in the tail, etc. And this is a, a pillus, these little fibers extending out. I'm not going to go over those uh, too much, but just to illustrate this uh, zooming in. So electron micrograph of, uh, uh, this is an Escherichia coli, or actually I think it's pronounced es uh, Escherichia coli, or E. coli. And this is from uh, old-ib-bioninja.com.au. Very fascinating. And here's nucleotide right there, stained, and you can see the color. is basically just a region in there. And there is the flagella plasmid is inside. Yeah, it's just that circular one that's outside of this, the, the main body there. All right, let's continue further. So the genetic information in a genome is held within genes, and the complete uh, assemblage of this information in an organism is called its genotype. 
genes encode the information needed by cells for the synthesis of proteins, which in turn play a central role in influencing the final phenotype of the organism or the observable traits. Yeah, and uh, here I'm just going to add this uh, just definition for this uh, flagella. So a flagellum, or a uh, plural flagella, is a hair-like appendage that protrudes from a wide range of microorganisms termed as uh, flagellates. Or uh, actually, the pronunciation is, uh, might be a flagellum or flagella. I just uh, Google that pronunciation. I thought it was fl flagellum. But yes, yeah, so a flagellum uh, is the one that Google pronunciation uh, states. So anyways, and then, uh, then this would be flagellates. Yes, fascinating stuff. All right, so now let's look at gene expression. And for further information, uh, you can look at the gene expression uh, Wikipedia article. All right, let's continue further. So uh, gene expression is the process by which information from a gene is used in a synthesis of a functional gene product that enables it to produce end products, which could be protein or non-coding RNA if it doesn't uh, code for a protein. Uh, and ultimately affect a phenotype, which is the observable trait, as the final effect, yeah, such as eye color, etc. The process is summarized in the central dogma of molecular biology, first formulated by Francis Crick in 1958. And note, a gene product is the biochemical material, either RNA or protein, resulting from expression of a gene uh, from the DNA. A measurement of the amount of gene product is sometimes used to infer how active a gene is. Abnormal amounts of gene product can be correlated with disease-causing alleles, such as the overactivity of oncogenes, which can cause cancer. Interesting. Uh, I'm going further. So a non-coding RNA or ncRNA is an RNA molecule that is not translated into a protein. The DNA sequence from which a functional non-coding RNA is transcribed is often called an RNA gene. Yeah, so you could have RNA genes inside the DNA genes. Uh, yeah, I mean inside the DNA, so you'll have the gene, you could call it RNA gene, uh, yeah, often called to, uh, to imply that, uh, to refer to non-coding RNA that gets expressed. Uh, and now going over the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, the central dogma of molecular, bi of molecular biology is an explanation of the flow of genetic information within a biological system. It is often stated as DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. Although this is not its original meaning, it was, f it was first stated, yeah, although this is not its original meaning, it was first stated by Francis Crick in 1957, then published in 1958. And uh, yeah, here is what he wrote. So the central dogma. This states that once, quote, information has passed into protein, it cannot get out again. In more detail, the transfer of information from nu nucleic acid to nucleic acid or from nucleic, uh, nucleic acid to protein may be possible, but transfer from protein to protein or from protein to nucleic acid is impossible. Information uh, means uh, yeah. Information means here the precise determination of sequence, either of bases in the nucleic acid or of amino acid residues in the protein. That's very interesting. Now here's a uh, diagram here. So information flow in biological systems. So you have uh, DNA right here. It can go to RNA and back and forth, or you can have DNA to DNA, or you could replicate itself. And this one right here, you could RNA replicate itself. So and this is a special case is, is in red. So general case it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. In a special case, you can have RNA uh, to its to another RNA or to itself. Yeah, and or the uh, general case of DNA, uh, it can go to its uh, another DNA or to itself, etc., or just replicate and uh, transmit across information. Uh, and yeah, so there's a general one here, and then the uh, special cases where RNA goes back to DNA, or uh, RNA goes to another RNA or uh, replicate itself. Yeah, so very interesting. Uh, so there's a general uh, general DNA to RNA to protein, and then the special case of RNA to RNA and uh, RNA to DNA, so going backwards, it's very fascinating. So gene expression is the most fundamental level at which a genotype gives rise uh, to a phenotype. So this genotype is, uh, is all the uh, genes, and uh, uh, a rise to a phenotype this is all the traits. So, uh, so basically genotype is all, all the uh, yeah, set of genes of an organism that has, and then uh, gives rise to a, a whole set of traits that an organism has, the phenotype, uh, or an observable trait. The genetic information stored in DNA represents uh, the genotype, whereas the phenotype results from the synthesis of proteins that control an organism's structure and development, or that act as enzymes catalyzing specific metabolic pathways. A large part of DNA 
EEG uh, 98% in humans is non-coding. So that's <laughs> very interesting here. Meaning that these sections do not serve as patterns for protein sequences. Yeah, so most of the DNA doesn't uh, actually <laughs> uh, code for a protein. So the, uh, I must note, the amount of non-coding DNA varies greatly among species. Often only a small percentage of the genome is responsible for coding proteins, but an increasing percentage is shown is being shown to have regulatory functions. When there's much non-coding DNA, a large uh, proportion appears to have no biological function, as predicted in the 1960s. Since that time, this non-functional portion has co controversially been called, quote, junk DNA. And uh, functional DNA estimates range widely from some being between 8 to 15% and others as great as 80%. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, brings up the question of the whole central dogma itself. Uh, yeah, so you have this uh, general, uh, general is from uh, DNA to RNA to protein, uh, but it actually, to be more specific, general is it doesn't go to protein because it's a... Uh, it's non-coding. 98% in humans, greater than that is non-coding the protein. So generally, you could have DNA to RNA or just DNA and nothing, <laughs> to be more accurate. All right, going over further here. So it was originally suggested that over 98% of the human genome does not encode protein sequences, while 20% of a typical pro prokaryote genome is non-coding. In 2013, a new, quote, record for the most efficient eukaryotic genomes was discovered with the... Yeah, it was discovered with this uh, this one here, I believe it's pronounced Utricularia, and then uh, Gibba or Jibba, a bladderwort plant that has only 3% non-coding DNA and 97% of coding DNA. Yeah, so it's a very interesting, the comparison uh, here. So this plant, 3% uh, non-coding and 97% coding, whereas humans is 98% uh, not coding. Uh, yeah, so 98% uh, not coding, then the other two would be uh, coding. That's very interesting. So in eukaryotes, continue for this, in eukaryotes, genome size and by extension the amount of non-coding DNA is not correlated to uh, to organism complexity. Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, these, these don't correlate to complexity, uh, which is a, a very interesting observation. And this was a, an observation known as a C-value enigma. For example, the genome of unicellular uh, polychaos dubium, formerly known as amoeba dubia, has been reported to contain more than 200 times the amount of DNA in humans. And the pufferfish uh, Takafugu uh, rubrates genome, uh, rubripes uh, genome is only about one eighth the size of the human genome. It seems to have a comparable number of genes and approximately 90% of the Takafugu genome is non-coding. Therefore, most of the difference in genome size is not due to variation in the amount of coding DNA, yeah, rather it is due to a difference in the amount of non-coding DNA. Yeah, so basically, yeah, the different genome sizes, it's going to be dependent on the how much non-coding DNA there is. And then this one right here is polychaos dobium, this unicellular, uh, yes, it has one cell, has 200 times the amount of DNA in humans. I would assume that is a very high uh, non-coding DNA. But uh, in this, um, yeah, in, in this uh, organism, I was trying to look for the actual amount of non-coding but it wasn't, uh, I couldn't find it. <laughs> I, had to, I did a lot of search and couldn't find the exact uh, number there. But but yeah, the only thing that they say is uh, pretty much just 200 times the amount of DNA in humans. Yeah, so for the most part, uh, most of the organisms have a lot of non-coding DNA, and that is the uh, reason for the genome size. So most of the difference in genome size is not due to variation of, of coding DNA because a lot of them are just non-coding. So this was 90%, humans is 98%, but a but this one is a uh, an outlier, this is a plant, a special case where it's only three um, percent. So yes, this genome size is mostly the coding. It's very interesting. And remember, the coding uh, codes for uh, protein sequences. If it's uh, non-coding, it's still pro uh, it's still yeah it's still translated to just an RNA. So a non-coding RNA is an RNA molecule that is not translated into a protein. So yeah, it goes from the DNA to RNA, but not to protein. So it's very fascinating stuff. And uh, yeah, so like uh, this uh, this image, <laughs> the general case should be DNA to RNA, and then that's it. And then the special case is to protein, because a, well, a lot of them don't actually go there. So uh, like, for example, humans, 98% doesn't go there. Okay, let's continue further. All right, so messenger RNA or uh, mRNA strands are created using DNA strands as a template in a process called transcription. Yeah, where DNA bases are exchanged for their corresponding bases, except in the case of thymine, 
T for which uh, RNA substitutes uracil. And uh, yeah, so under the genetic code, these mRNA strands specify the sequence of amino acids within proteins uh, in a process called translation. So you go transcription, goes from DNA to, uh, to RNA, you switch up the thymine for uracil, and then uh, translation is from RNA to uh, proteins. Yeah, so, or, or the amino acids. So uh, under the genetic code, these mRNA strands specify the sequence of amino acids within proteins in a process called translation, which occurs in ribosomes. This process is used by all, all life, eukaryotes, including multicellular uh, organisms, and uh, prokaryotes, uh, these without uh, nucleus, bacteria, and archaea, archaea, or archaea. Uh, and utilized by viruses to generate the macromolecular machinery for life. Uh, gene products are often proteins, but in non-protein coding genes such as transfer RNA or tRNA and small nuclear RNA, snRNA, the product is a functional non-coding RNA. Yeah, so now uh, let's go a uh, note on this uh, transfer RNA. So M uh, MES note a transfer RNA, abbreviated tRNA and formally referred to as as uh, sRNA for soluble RNA is an adapter molecule composed of RNA, typically 76 to 90 nucleotides in length uh, in eukaryotes, that serves as a physical link between the mRNA and the amino acid sequence of proteins. Yeah, so mRNA goes to the, goes to the amino acids, which is the uh, makes up the proteins, and and this transfer RNA is a non-coding, so it doesn't go to protein, but it's still functional. Uh, a, yeah, it's still functional RNA, so it still has a specific function here. Uh, so, for example, let's look at this over here. Yeah, so here's the interaction of tRNA and mRNA in a protein uh, in protein synthesis. So this strand right here, this is the messenger RNA that's actually being that's actually encoding the specific amino acids. And what happens here is, so you have these uh, sequence of the nucleotides or the base pairs A A uh, C U etc. Yeah, then what happens is a transfer RNA, incoming tRNA bound to an amino acid. So this transfer RNA is stuck to an amino acid, uh, amino acid like this one here, and the sequence re relates to AAG, and then it sticks to the part here that is uh, that's correlated to this. So that that has the the same connecting setup on these base pairs with uh, via hydrogen bond. So in this case, A connects with U, yeah, and then C connects with G. So you, here we have two U's and a and a C, I mean G connects with a C, yeah. So then we have two, two U's and a G, so then the tRNA that corresponds to AAG connects to here, and then this uh, amino acid gets stuck to the next, next uh, sequence. And then this out, outgoing empty tRNA, and then you have this growing peptide chain. So this connects to it, brings it over here, and then uh, sends it over there. And then this is what's being encoded, while these transfer RNAs are uh, acting, uh, or have a, f have a specific function to bring it about. So very interesting. Now going further, so small nuclear uh, RNA or sRNA is a class of small RNA molecules that are found within the cell nucleus in eukaryotes. And then you notice the, the length of this one right here, transfer RNA small, this long messenger RNA. Yes, typically. Uh, so small RNA are polymeric uh, RNA molecules that are less than 200 nucleotides in length and are usually non-coding. Yeah, so this one is transfer RNA is a small, so it's typically 76 to 90 nucleotides. And now here's an interesting write-up, uh, just to illustrate the here, because uh, in this simple interaction, we have uh, uh, tRNA and mRNA, and, there's, and it's synthesizing one protein. So uh, let's read this up here. This is from the uh, PN, PNAS.org website, which is uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. It's a, quote, peer-reviewed uh, journal. Uh, historically, it has been understood that for gene expression in eukaryotes, each messenger RNA encodes a single protein. With the recent development of technologies to, uh, of technologies to sequence full-length transcripts on mass, uh, we have uh, discovered hundreds of examples in two species of green algae where two, three, or more proteins are translated from a single transcript. These polycystronic transcripts are found in diverse species throughout the green uh, uh, al algal uh, lineage. Uh, which highlights their biological importance. We have leveraged these findings to uh, co-express or express together pairs of genes on polycystronic transcripts in vitro 
uh, in the lab, which should facilitate efforts to engineer algae for research and industrial applications, which is uh, quite fascinating. So they're basically uh, producing multiple proteins for multiple pairs of genes at the same, yeah, with pairs of genes at the same time. Uh, very fascinating. And uh, the, term po the term, quote, polycystronic describes a situation in which two, uh, which is a, a, a bi bicystronic or dicystronic, -cy or three uh, tricitronic or more separate proteins are encoded on a single molecule of messenger RNA or mRNA. In prokaryotes, uh, pro uh, poly polycystronic expression is common. So yeah, in prokaryotes, very fascinating. Yeah, and uh, note that the uh, algae uh, are, uh, are have nucleus, so they are uh, eukaryotes. Yeah, so these are eukaryotes. So yeah, so special. Uh, yeah, so they, they were able to find out that it actually. Um, yeah, I actually show an example of eukaryotes showing uh, polycystronic transcripts uh, or, or, or polycystronic. And in prokaryotes, uh, polycystronic expression is common, which is interesting. So a, uh, a cistron is an alternative form of uh, for gene, hence the uh, polygene, basically saying it's polygene, so uh, the cistron. So this uh, polycystronic. Now let's look at the uh, NIH right here. This is uh, from... Uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, the U.S. government website. So uh, from uh, www.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. So recognition of the polycystronic nature of human genes is critical to understanding the genotype-phenotype relationship. Conclusions, we need to unlearn our misconception of the gene, accepting its polycystronic nature to strive for a better understanding of the, of the genomic complexity underlying physiological and pathological mechanisms. So absolutely uh, very interesting stuff here. All right, so now let's continue further. So all steps in the gene expression process can be regulated, including the transcription, the DNA to RNA, the RNA splicing and translation, which is RNA to proteins, and post-translational modification of a protein. So all steps, you can regulate uh, the amounts and so on, slow down, speed it up. And uh, I mean, just note, uh, let's look at RNA slicing here. So RNA slicing in molecular biology is a form of RNA processing in which a newly made precursor messenger RNA or pre-mRNA transcript is transformed into a mature messenger RNA or mRNA. It works by removing introns, which are uh, non-coding regions of RNA, and so joining together exons, which are code coding regions. Yes, yeah, so you have a bunch of regions that are not coding, the introns, then the coding ones are the exons, and then when you remove the, uh, remove the introns, you're going to end up with the, uh, the exons connected together. All right, so let's take a look at this figure. So introns are removed and exons joined together in the process of RNA splicing. Yes, yeah, so you have DNA right there, and this green one's uh, likely just an enzyme that uh, catalyzes the uh, the reaction or the uh, speeds up the reaction to go from DNA into uh, RNA right here. So yes, this is the long RNA transcript. So in other words, this is transcription. And this is uh, HNRNA. And uh, note that uh, HNRNA, the term HNRNA is often used as a synonym for pre-mRNA. Uh, so basically uh, just before it's messenger or mature RNA. Although in the strict sense, HNRNA may include nuclear RNA transcripts that do not end up as cytoplasmic mRNA. So yeah, basically you get this uh, precursor uh, messenger RNA or pre-mRNA or uh, uh, precursor mature RNA is transferred into mature messenger RNA or mRNA. Uh, and then it, re it removes uh, introns and uh, connects the exons. So what you have is this, you have a bunch of the red ones are the, uh, the introns that don't code and the exons are the ones that do code for proteins. And uh, you say something like this. What you end up having here is uh, this case where here you have a donor site GU. This is the, uh, the nuclear base. This is the intron in red. And then there's a branch site here and this acceptor site here for the spliceosome. So what happens is um, yeah, you'll get these uh, ribonucleoproteins or SNRNPs. We'll get, those, uh, get to those in a bit. So they connect over here at this acceptor site, this AG uh, nucleo uh, base or nucleotide uh, region. Yeah, up to the A, and then uh, and then what happens? You have uh, more nucleo uh, uh, ribonucleoproteins on this side, and then it connects. And this is this is your spliceosome will will basically cut off this, and then bring these together. And then it takes uh, then the uh, spliceosome takes away this RNA lariat or RNA uh, loop like that, and then you get a mature RNA only exons. Yes, 
fascinating stuff there. And uh, here's a simple illustration of exons and introns and pre-mRNA. This is zoom in of this this region right there. So what you end up having is this is the uh, this is the acceptor. Or this is a donor site, the GU. Well, a donor site there. This is number four, and this is at the five end of the uh, RNA. Yeah, typically going like that. Then there's a three end of the uh, D of the RNA. A uh, simple illustration of exons and introns and pre-mRNA. And note that this PYY, yeah, PY, PY, PY indicates a region of high per, uh, pyrimidines, C and U. Remember, uh, pyrimidines, uh, whoops, let's click here. Yeah, remember this word here, if, if you search it up, uh, these are, uh, nuclear bases are simple ring molecules. Yeah, so they're simple ring, and then the purines are the, uh, uh, the fused ring. So those are fused rings, these are simple rings, these are cytosine, thi thymine, DNA only, and uracil RNA. So in this case, it's C and U, that's a region of high, um, yeah, of high C and U and RNA. Yeah, so high, uh, region of high, uh, pyrimidines, C and U. Yeah, so let's just zoom in there. And the, and this is, uh, also called the pyrimidine tract is a region of pre-messenger M, uh, yeah, pre-messenger RNA, mRNA that promotes the assembly of spliceosome, the protein complex specialized for carrying out RNA splicing during the process of post-transcriptional modification. So yes, after it's transcribed, and now your post, uh, transcriptional modif, post-transcriptional modification, removing these introns. And going over, uh, the region is rich with pyramid, uh, pyramididine nucleotides, especially uracil, and it's usually 15 to 20 base pairs long, located about 5 to 40 base pairs before the three end of the intron to be spliced. Yeah, so there's the intron, so there's the three end there. Now let's go further. So SNRNP is pronounced SNRPs. Uh, this is right here, uh, these SNRPs right there. <laughs> Interesting pronunciation. Uh, or small nuclear uh, ribonucleoproteins are RNA protein compl complexes that combine with unmodified pre-mRNA and various other proteins to form a spliceosome, a large RNA protein molecular uh, complex, uh, which uh, splicing uh, upon which splicing of mRNA uh, occurs. Uh, note that a lariat uh, is or lasso is a loop of rope used to catch horses. Yeah, and uh, there's our uh, lariat right there. It just loops over, and then, yeah, that's uh, just a, a loop of rope. Or in this case, RNA. So, uh, a post, uh, let's go here. So, actually, yeah, this one here. So, a precursor mRNA. Pre-mRNA is a type of primary transcript that becomes a messenger RNA or mRNA after processing or post-transcriptional uh, modification. Yeah, and then uh, a post, uh, in this one right here, is a post-transcriptional -transcript modification or Co-transcriptional modification is a set of biological processes common to most eukaryotic cells uh, by which an RNA primary transcript is chemically altered by a following transcription from a gene to produce a mature functional RNA molecule that can uh, then leave the nucleus and perform, and perform any of a various, uh, of, of any of a variety of different functions in the cell. And uh, a primary transcript is the single-stranded uh, ribonucleic acid RNA product synthesized by transcription of DNA and processed to yield, yield various mature RNA products such as uh, mRNAs, uh, transfer RNA, and RNAs. This is rRNAs. Uh, we'll go over this one. So this is R, R, uh, lowercase rRNAs, ribonu uh, ribosomal uh, ribonucleic acid rRNA is a type of non-coding RNA. So basically ribo ribosomal RNA is a type of non-coding RNA, which is a primary component of ribosomes essential to all cells. Uh, rRNA is a ribo ribozyme, which carries out protein synthesis in ribosomes. And ribozymes are, uh, or ribonucleic acid enzymes, uh, are RNA molecules that have the ability to catalyze specific bio biochemical reactions, including RNA splicing in gene expression, uh, similar to the action of protein enzymes. Yes, yeah, so basically, uh, uh, basically RNA that that acts as an enzyme similar to protein uh, enzymes. Very interesting. Uh, mature messenger RNA, often uh, abbreviated as mature uh, mRNA, is a euka eukaryotic RNA transcript that has been spliced and processed and is ready for translation in the course of protein synthesis. Unlike the eukaryotic RNA immediately, immediately after transcription known as precursor messenger RNA, mature mRNA 
consists exclusively of exons, coding regions, and has all the introns and non-coding regions removed. Uh, post -trans translational is the difference uh, here. And uh, this one here is uh, yeah. Go if you go back to the uh, the starting point here. So we went we went from translation RNA to proteins, and now post translational modification. Remember this post transcriptional modification. That's getting over to uh, that's getting from here. This is transcription, and then post transcription. Uh, now you remove the uh, introns. That's a that's an example of post transcription. Now we're dealing with post translational. So after it's uh, made it into a protein. Yeah, so let's go over here. So post translational modification, PTM refers to the covalent and generally enzy enzymatic modification of proteins following protein biosynthesis. And protein biosynthesis or protein synthesis is a core biological process occurring inside cells, balancing the loss of cellular proteins via degradation or export uh, through the production of new proteins. Yes, uh, fascinating stuff. So uh, let's just uh, look at this figure right here. Uh, so protein biosynthesis starting from trans, starting with transcription and post transcriptional modifications in the nucleus. Then the mature mRNA is exported to the cytoplasm where it is translated, and the polypeptide chain then folds and is post translationally modified. So we have over here RNA polymerase, yeah, which is again that enzyme uh, as I stated here. That's probably the enzyme. It's always just a, <laughs> almost always just an enzyme here when you're dealing with uh, biology. The en enzyme that catalyzes the formation of RNA. So let's go over here. So you have a RNA polymerase. Uh, you get from transcription to produce pre uh, mRNA. And then you have post transcriptional modification, remove introns and and, and, uh, uh, and otherwise and other stuff like that. And now you have this. This is a nucleus right here, and it gets out through this uh, protein channel. Yeah, it's nuclear pore complex. It allows to remove from the uh, nucleus there. Uh, uh, and export of mature mRNA into cytoplasm. So inside the outside the nucleus, inside the cell. And then what you have is. Yeah, is the translation process a ribosome? This is a ribosome with transfer RNAs that are helping out in the uh, uh, translating the mRNA into proteins. So translation of mature mRNA, and then you get a protein, and then you, yeah, now you have a protein folding. Yeah, so I guess uh, that's not part of it. Yeah, that's not part of the translation. So you have a, uh, you basically you forming the proteins of a long strand of all these uh, amino acids, and then they fold together. So you have protein folding, get a, a big lump, and post translational modifications uh, is where it's modified afterwards. This fascinating stuff. Now let's go further. And uh, this is regulation now. And if you go back to before the MES note, uh, we go over here. Um, uh, basically, uh, all steps in a gene expression process can be regulated. So managed um, and so on and sped up, slow down. So let's go over here. So regulation of gene expression gives control over the timing, location and amount of a given gene product, protein or nCRNA or non-coding RNA present in a cell and can have a profound effect on cellular structure and function. Right, let's go over here now. Now let's look at the extended central dogma of molecular biology, and this includes all the processes involved in the flow of genetic information. Yes, yeah, so you have uh, DNA polymerase. Uh, oh, no, well, you have DNA right here, and, D and then there's the DNA polymerase, uh, the enzyme, and it uh, basically allows for DNA replication. So you go from DNA to DNA, so it's information flow like that way. And now you have this way right here, uh, transcription DNA to RNA using the RNA polymerase um, yeah, enzyme. And then you, if you go backwards, so you get instead of transcription, you get reverse transcription, and that's using the reverse transcriptase enzymes. So it's going from uh, DNA, I mean RNA to DNA. And now, yeah, now you have this RNA. We'll get to what this uh, sense RNA is soon. So uh, this uh, sense RNA note uh, right here, yeah, indicated by the plus, uh, it can go over to RNA replication. So you can replicate this RNA over to uh, another RNA. And then this is, again, this, this will use RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, another enzyme to go into this sense RNA, uh, this negative sense RNA right here. And then likewise, uh, you can go backwards over to the sense RNA. And this has to do where, with the direction right here. So this sense RNA can't go to the protein. I'm mean, just negative sense. This positive sense can go to the protein. We'll get to that in a bit. And then now you have translation where you have RNA to protein via the ribosomes. And there's a protein chain of nuclei, uh, chain of amino acids. Just fascinating stuff. So MES note, a DNA polymerase is a, is a member of a family of enzymes that catalyzes the, synth the synthesis of DNA molecules 
from nucleoside triphosphates, the molecular precursors of DNA. And uh, that is over here, so DNA, DNA polymerase, uh, and yeah, it, it synthesized DNA molecules from these triphosphates. And so yeah, you could replicate it in using that too. So you could replicate it. You can get a DNA strand and then get some triphosphates, DNA polymerase, and, and, and replicate that. Uh, and now RNA uh, polymerase, abbreviated RNAP or RNA pol, and officially DNA directed dependent or DNA directed or dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme that synthesizes RNA from a DNA template. Yeah, so it, go, it goes from if you have DNA template and you have this uh, RNA polymerase uh, enzyme, and then you can get to this uh, RNA right there. And now uh, a reverse transcriptase RT is an enzyme used to generate complementary DNA or cDNA from an RNA template, a process termed reverse transcription. So if you go from RNA to DNA, that's called a, a complementary DNA, so it's cDNA, using this reverse, reverse transcriptase enzyme. So now let's discuss the sense of a nucleic acid. Uh, we uh, briefly talked about it over here for the RNA, so the plus and the minus here. Uh, so the plus goes to, uh, goes to the protein and then the minus does not uh, go uh, directly to it. So you need to get first over to this plus sense before you can get to the protein. So going over the sense. So the sense of a nucleic acid molecule, particularly of a strand of DNA or RNA, refers to the nature of the roles of the strand and its complement in specifying a sequence of amino acids. Depending on the context, sense may have slightly different meanings. So this is an <laughs> interesting one. So yes, there is some confusion about it, but again, depending on the context, it's pretty obvious. Uh, for example, DNA is positive sense if an RNA version of the same sequence is translated or translatable into protein, negative sense if not. And uh, what this has to do is with the complement nature, yeah, so the complement nature of, uh, of nucleic acids. And we'll get to that in a, uh, right over here. So because of the complementary nature of, of uh, base pairing between nu nucleic acids, uh, polymers, a double-stranded DNA molecule will be composed of two strands with sequences that are reverse complements of each other. To help mole molecular biologists sp specifically identify each strand individually, the two strands are usually differentiated as the, quote, sense strand and the, quote, anti-sense strand. An individual st strand of DNA is referred to as a positive sense, also a uh, positive with a plus, or simply sense if its nu nucleotide sequence uh, corresponds directly to the sequence of an RNA transcript, which is translated or translatable into a sequence of amino acids, provided that thymine, the T, uh, nu nucleobase uh, bases in the DNA sequence are replaced with uracil uh, bases in the RNA sequence. Yeah, and uh, the other strand of the double-stranded DNA molecule is referred to as a negative sense, also negative the minus, or antisense, and is reverse complementary to both the positive sense strand and the RNA transcript. It is actually the antisense strand that is used as a template from which RNA polymerases construct the RNA transcript but the complementary base pairing by which nucleic acid polymerization occurs means that the sequence of the RNA transcript will look identi identical to the sense strand apart from the RNA transcript's use of uracil instead of thymine. Uh, for example, here, just to illustrate here, so it has the complement nature. Yeah, so the complement nature, for example, this DNA one right here. So it'll have uh, this going this direction like that. Uh, th and then this going to the pl uh, this one here. We'll call this a plus that matches up with this one here. You notice how this, yeah, this plus matches up with this over here. And then the minus one would be the complement uh, set up on it or uh, down here. So that's a minus, and that does not match up with this, which goes to the protein. So then this is the plus uh, or sense, and this is the uh, negative sense or anti-sense, like that. And uh, yeah, that matches up. And then the, uh, the RNA polymerase, which uh, transcribes the DNA to RNA, would use the negative sense strand. And then plus the, the protein or enzyme. And then gets it over here. So it's always reverse complement. Because uh, basically uh, going this way is the opposite. So this, this way uh, is the, it, it's the same as, the, as, as going backwards, but in reverse direction. Yeah. So basically it's the same uh, base pairs, but then in reverse, reverse direction. And obviously you're going to be replacing T, the thymine, with your cell for RNA. Yeah, so that is for DNA. And RNA is just uh, the one goes to the protein and then negative if it, does, if it can't go directly to the protein.
Uh, going further here, just to illustrate some confusion now. So sometimes the phrases coding strand and template strand are encountered in place of sense and antisense, respectively. And in the context of a double-stranded DNA molecule, the usage of these terms is, is essentially equivalent. However, the coding slash sense, and I believe this is from Wikipedia, but I believe it's just uh, referring to the coding one right here. Again, it depends on how you're defining it. Uh, the coding slash sense strand need, uh, need not always contain a code that is used to make a protein. Both protein coding and non-coding RNAs may be transcribed. And note the confusion. Some definitions have coding slash sense as translatable into protein. Uh, and others, yes, the coding or the sense, and others as simple transcribable to RNA. So yeah, so so basically there's two ways uh, uh, general, generally you could look at it. It's either you look at it by using this minus strand right here as a template and call that a coding one or a sense that it goes to the RNA. Uh, I mean, that, that use the coding one would be, the, I mean, this would be the template, never mind. This is a template, the negative one is a template, or the antisense, or the negative. And then it's used to code for RNA. Code for RNA, and, th and this ends up getting is the plus sense. So you get the plus right here. Uh, uh, yeah, so it does not necessarily have to go, have, have to be able to translate to protein. Does not have to be. It could either go this or just into a uh, non-translatable, yeah, or not. That's one definition. Um, and the other one that was mentioned uh, or, earlier here, that's just the, uh, if it's able to go to the protein, then it's the plus. So this one plus, if it goes able to the protein uh, from this plus strand, if it matches up going, going to the protein. But if you're, uh, but in other ones, if you're just looking at the coding slash template, you could just view the negative sense as, as a template and the plus as a, as a yeah as the the identical one to the actual rna being transcribed and call that coding or uh, or uh yeah call that coding or sense uh but yeah i think it would, this would, it would have made more sense if they ignored this sense right here in the wikipedia i copied the permit anyways going further so source this one is from this uh website uh s c i dot s d uh s u dot edu let me just copy uh this link yeah, this is uh, from San Diego University, so sdsu. Uh, dot edu. So the term template strand refers to the sequence of DNA that is copied during the synthesis of mRNA. The opposite strand, that is a strand with a base sequence directly corresponding to the mRNA sequence, is called the coding strand or the mRNA-like strand because of the sequence corresponds to the codons that are translated into protein. So yes, uh, this one would have made much more sense if they just stuck with this and ignored the sense one right here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I included that. Uh, this should illustrate that there is a bit of confusion and, and this, um, uh, this um, San Diego University also mentioned some of the confusion. Uh, but anyway, so here's the uh, position of the template and coding strands uh, during transcription. And, and uh, yeah, let's just uh, zoom in here actually a bit. I'll just zoom in like this or make this a bit bigger. So what we end up having is, uh, so this is the five end is the three end. Uh, and then just going backwards from three to five. Uh, so coding strand of DNA complementary to the template strand. So this is the coding one. And then this is the template strand of uh, RNA. Remember you have it going like this. So one of them is gonna be minus, and then the opposite one is gonna be the plus. So in this case, you have the minus right here. This is the minus, or call it just template strand. Because notice that it doesn't matter, in this definition that uh, San Diego uses, they use coding and template, and they're not talking about whether it can go to protein. It can, it's just basically saying it's the mRNA that's being uh, shown. Uh, it, it's just, it matches the mRNA. So for example here, so if this, this sequence are T, A, C, G, A, A, et cetera, going all the way, then you have RNA polymerase and direction of uh, RNA polymerase movement goes this way. And it's gonna be, um, and, it, and it's gonna be pulling out or matching up with these uh, RNA strands. I mean, uh, this D DNA is gonna match, it's gonna create an RNA equivalent. So for example, um, so this one right here, let's say it gets to the T. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's just uh, look at this a bit slowly here. So uh, notice how this one here goes from, let's say this U. Let's look at it from here. So it goes A, A, yes, yeah, so it goes A, A, C, G, T, G, T, A, A, like that. And then the uh, then then if you view it as hydrogen bonds all the way to the hydrogen, um, to the opposite side uh, for the uh, base pairing. So this A and T goes there, so A, T. Then this is AT, et cetera. And then this is AT down here and so on. So what ends up happening is 
uh, in this case right here. So it, this was matching up with a T, but instead to the, do the RNA, it replaces the T with a U. So this becomes a U. This is the U in the matching, just to just to uh, replicate this one here. So then, so then uh, this will be A is going to match up with with a U, and then uh, they're going to have T here, which was matching up with an A. So you already have an A there. So this matches up. This U and T is going to match up with this, this, and then A is over here, C is over here, C is over there, etc. And then all the way over here, this was T, so this can be U. And notice how this is exactly the, uh, the same as this. Yeah, so it's exactly the same one. So it's basically the RNA polymerase uses this as a template to create RNA that ha that matches up with this, which is it is called the coding strand or the sense strand in this definition. And it does not in this definition does not matter if it goes to a protein or yes, it doesn't go matter if it goes to a, a protein or non-coding RNA. So it just goes to straight RNA. So it's fascinating stuff. And let's continue further. So that was the sense for DNA, uh, an, RNA uh, an RNA sequence that is complementary to an endogenous mRNA transcript, which is just within a cell, is sometimes called antisense uh, RNA. In other words, it is a non-coding strand complementary to the coding sequence of RNA. So and this, this uh, for RNA, it's uh, the only definition I've seen was that just that it goes to uh, either protein or, or doesn't go. So an endogenous substances and processes are those that originate from within a system, such as an organism, tissue, or cell. And exogenous uh, sub substances and processes contrast with endogenous ones, such as drugs, yeah, which origi or originate from outside of the organism. So you go outside and then you put it inside. Like you take drugs from outside of the organism and you put it inside. So it's fascinating stuff here. So yeah, so that the DNA, um, the RNA one is pretty straightforward. So plus sense, if we can go to a protein, negative sense if it doesn't and this is the exact same as this but in the uh, opposite end of it, uh, the opposite direction and uh, yeah fascinating fascinating stuff